Hello, and welcome to Politics for the People. I'm your host, Michael Striano. Thanks for listening and joining in the conversation. You can find links to our Patreon and Instagram in the show notes and sign up for our weekly newsletter. Don't forget to subscribe if you haven't and leave a review wherever you get your podcasts to help others find the show. Okay, let's get to it. On this week's episode, we're going to take a look at presidential pardons, something you've probably heard quite a bit about in the news lately. Pardons can be granted on the state level, but those are normally issued by governors, so we're going to limit our scope just to pardons issued by the president. Some pardons make massive headlines, while others go largely unnoticed. And sometimes they're called commutations instead of pardons. We'll take a look at the differences and the history behind this unique executive power. Before we get to the definition, we should clarify something. A pardon is only one type of clemency that can be granted. It's the most well-known type, but when we talk about pardons, the conversation is really about clemency. So that's the first term we'll define. Clemency is the changing of a federal sentence by the President of the United States. There are four types of clemency that can be granted. A pardon, which wipes out a federal crime. A commutation, shortening a sentence. A respite, delaying a sentence. Or a remission, eliminating legal obligations, such as fines. We've mentioned in past episodes how the Constitution is surprisingly vague in a number of areas, especially the presidency. One of the few powers explicitly given to the president is the granting of clemency, with the only explicit exception being in cases of impeachment. As the Constitution was being drawn up and negotiated in 1787, there were a number of ideas taken from British law the Founding Fathers sought to improve. Once again, Alexander Hamilton comes up as a major player. The original drafts of the Constitution did not contain the idea of pardons. They were championed by Hamilton, and added through a series of amendments that originally contained a provision requiring Senate approval for clemency regarding issues of treason. This was likely changed to the impeachment exception as the document was developed and the responsibilities for investigating and convicting of treason were given to Congress. Interestingly, there was one delegate at the convention who felt so strongly treason should not be pardonable, he refused to sign the Constitution. George Mason from Pennsylvania argued that a president with the power to pardon the crime of treason would be dangerous if that president themselves was a corrupt co-conspirator. Some historians date the idea of clemency back to ancient Greece and Rome, but the Founding Fathers based theirs on the English version, which dates back to around 700 AD, when the prerogative of mercy was first introduced to the monarchy. Over time, Parliament placed restrictions on the practice, over fears that corrupt monarchs would sell pardons or use them as bribes. In the early days of our country, presidents seemed to have used pardons as a means of strengthening the young country. We had a number of hiccups along the way as we figured out what our country would look like and how the government would interact with its citizens. During Washington's presidency, we faced an early challenge to the strength of our government in the Whiskey Rebellion. Distillers, believing they had just fought a war to be free of abusive taxes, were enraged and felt targeted by the government when taxes on alcohol were enacted. The resulting uprising required 13,000 federalized troops to quell. Washington's response was to use his power to grant clemency as a means of extending mercy to temper the administration of justice as he pardoned the organizers. Similarly, when Jefferson believed the citizenry was being unjustly prosecuted by government overreach, he exercised the power on his first day in office— pardoning all convicted under the Sedition Act, which made it illegal to defame the government. In 1865, Lincoln's vice president and successor, Andrew Johnson, used the pardon power in a new way, preemptively. In the wake of the Civil War, 
Johnson issued a blanket pardon to Confederates, accepting those who had helped orchestrate the secession from and war against the Union. Shortly after, he began granting clemency to those who had been accepted by his blanket pardon, and ultimately granted clemency for over 90%, or 13,000, of the petitioners. History has come to see this as a stain on Johnson's record, as a number of the Confederate leaders granted clemency would become architects of Jim Crow. One recipient of the blanket pardon was named Augustus Hill Garland, a former Confederate senator and attorney. Earlier in 1865, a law was passed disbarring Confederates. When the blanket pardon did not reinstate him to the bar, Garland argued before the Supreme Court that he was still being punished for a crime for which he had been forgiven. The Supreme Court ruled on his behalf and found that pardons could be issued without an individual having been convicted or even charged with a crime. Pardons, along with seemingly everything else, have become polarizing political landmines of sorts, dating back to Lincoln's pardoning of Dakota tribesmen. After the violation of several treaties by the U.S. and facing extreme hunger, the Dakota tribes sought to drive white settlers from their ancestral lands, burning settlements and killing over 600 in the process. In retaliation, more than 500 Native Americans were killed, and hundreds more were captured and sentenced to execution, the vast majority of which were not responsible for the uprising. Lincoln saw these additional death sentences as innocent people being made examples of through extrajudicial killings. Knowing the pardons would be politically unpopular, the president was quoted as saying he could not afford to hang men for votes. Over 100 years later, Gerald Ford famously granted a preemptive pardon to his predecessor, Richard Nixon. Nixon had been impeached by the House of Representatives and faced an almost certain conviction by the Senate. Rather than tarnish his record further and put the country through the pain and division of a president's conviction and removal from office, Nixon resigned and Vice President Ford took the helm. Seeking to begin the healing and reunifying of the country, Ford granted the unconditional pardon for any and all crimes that may have been committed. The decision is attributed with ending Ford's career and leaving an indelible mark on his reputation. During Nixon's impeachment trial, he delegated a special project to his deputy attorney general, Mary C. Lawton. She was to investigate if a president had the right or ability to pardon themselves. The idea still has never been tested, and there aren't any explicit bars or barriers in the Constitution. This conversation has persisted to this day, with the two prevailing schools of thought being the absence of mention from the Constitution grants the president that power, and the Constitution's barring from individuals serving as their own judges makes the power illegal and unconstitutional. The latter was Lawton's conclusion, although she did note there was nothing in the Constitution barring the president from stepping aside and being pardoned by their vice president. A good amount of this episode has been anecdotes displaying how clemency works and how the idea has evolved over time. So let's take a moment to look at how someone is granted clemency. Since the power is singularly vested in the president, they can grant clemency to whomever they choose. But for normal people without the means of reaching the president directly, there is a series of steps that must be followed. Even then, most petitions are not granted. First, a petition must be filed with the Office of the Pardon Attorney, an office in the Department of Justice created to handle petitions for clemency. The requirements for the petition start from the very beginning, and even illegibility can be a disqualifying factor. The fully completed, notarized petitions can include supplemental documents making the case for the petitioner. The petitions also include a mandatory five-year waiting period, allegedly designed to help petitioners prove their ability to lead a responsible, productive, and law-abiding life. 
This period can be waived, but that only happens in exceptional circumstances and is very rare. As part of the petition review process, a thorough background check will be conducted, so it is advised that the petitioners be upfront and enumerate their past records, including any civil, state, or other federal offenses. In addition to all of this information, a minimum of three character affidavits are required, and relatives by blood or marriage are ineligible to act as character references. Any inaccurate information will result in the petition being denied and willfully providing false information in a petition for clemency is punishable by up to five years imprisonment and a potential fine of up to $250,000. One important caveat here is that even a presidential pardon does not expunge a conviction from a petitioner's record. Whenever filling out paperwork, asking about past convictions, even a crime for which they have received a pardon will still need to be listed. A pardon, and clemency in general, is not something anyone should assume is going to happen for them. And the best course of action is, obviously, not to commit a federal crime. That said, there have been times throughout our history where laws or court rulings have been unjust. The president's authority to unilaterally change a wrong sentence is appropriate in a country that trains its children to recite and justice for all, so long as the president is just themselves. As with Lincoln and the Dakota tribesmen, or Carter pardoning those who evaded the draft during the Vietnam War, pardons are not always popular actions. But when they're for the good of the country, as Ford argued in the case of Nixon, they have proven to be a useful tool in uniting and moving the country forward. Thanks for listening, and a special thanks to our patrons on Patreon for your help in making this happen, and all those who have left us a review. Be sure to check out the show notes, where you can sign up for our weekly newsletter, and follow us on Instagram, at Politics for the People Podcast. Want to help shape the conversation, have a say in episode topics, and get exclusive content, including early access to episodes and live conversations with me? Check the show notes, head on over to our Patreon page, and subscribe for as little as $3. We'll see you Wednesday with our newsletter, and Friday with a brand new episode. Take care.